Wow. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, and um, good morning. Um, I'm pleased, I'm thrilled actually to be back at GLD um, talking about the topics of refugees and migration. And thank you, Dominic, for the warm welcome and Steffi for hosting and organizing. I remember we first actually touched upon the topic on refugees, mass migration, and tech, um, DLD, six months ago, so in January. It was the first panel on tech refugees, uh, the organization of how do you actually organize and orchestrate aid. And it was largely about emergency response, actually. So how do you actually use technology to bring people together and have emergency response, immediate coverage on the islands in southern Europe, so be it Greece, be it Italy, and the role technology can play. And now, as the topic is evolving, we are evolving at the DLD in our sessions and discussions, which I find profoundly exciting. Um, in New York, uh, what Dominic just mentioned, we talked about the role of technology in actually managing streams. So from emergency response in January to actually how do you organize this better with technology? So how do you predict streams? So when is who arriving at what train station so that the governments can actually be better prepared and help can be better organized? How do you actually model streams when you're trying to organize the whole asylum process? So who do you need where and when? What type of competencies? What type of resources? What type of volumes are actually going through your systems? So these pictures of the lines we saw in 2015 with the notion of governments being overwhelmed, like people coming into the country, long lines, we didn't know who was there, we didn't know how to receive them, register them, and treat them, actually, um, were the themes of 2015, and this was the second theme in New York, actually, how to help organize those streams with the help of technology and with the help of right-sizing the entire process. And now, today, um, we are on to integration, because really, um, the emergency response is not over, and obviously the backlog in asylum seeking is not entirely managed down yet. At the same time, with us speeding up the process dramatically from coming from the asylum process of over five months, 5.3 to be exact, for every single case to be processed, actually to sizing it down to about 48 hours in about 50% of the cases. So imagine that, from five months dealing with one case, and the actual time dealing with the case was less than a day. So what do you need to do? You need to identify the person, you need to register them, you need to listen to their case, you need to actually summarize it and come to a conclusion whether under our law and standards by different definitions across the EU, but largely at the same, is that person granted asylum, yes or no? That actually takes less than a day if you have the right process in place, if you have the right resources along the process, so from security to the decision makers in the asylum process, to the translators, to the people actually who can document and then hand out the decision. So we brought that down from five months to 48 hours for literally like half of the cases, which is tremendous. And obviously it gives people lots of stability, clarity on their decision, and it's just fair. It's fair from a European perspective to have clarity and transparency, to have quality in the process. So like, this is what we ask you. This is all the elements we need to cover in the process. We'll do that timely. We'll do that actually in the right order. And therefore, we come to a stable decision that is going to be the same whether you're in country A or B, or whether you're in the north or the south of the country. So producing stable outcomes for the people who actually need it. With picking up speed, which is actually great news, and we're, as I said, we're not done yet. There's still a backlog to be done, and obviously the Greek-EU-Turkey um, um, treaty helps in the entire process. So with less people coming in, the, the backlog is actually melting down a little. Um, but with that and with speeding it up, now the topic of integration, suddenly from being five months out from the time the person walks into the asylum office, now is actually 48 hours out for 50% of the cases, which means after 48 hours, about 70% of the people coming into Europe right now, into Germany in particular, are getting a positive decision. So they are protected under the asylum law, which means about 70% of the people, so last year about a million came, 700,000 of them will get a positive answer. And they're here to stay, and we're here to actually help them integrate them. And not after five months like it was before, and you had some time for planning, and where do you send them to, and where's the language course, and how do you train them, and what competencies do they have. You actually need to get that in a row very quickly, within 48 hours, because they will be going to the local communities at that point, and everybody, so from government to civil society to businesses, everybody really needs to get their ducks in a row very quickly. Um, so that we can actually receive those 700,000 people um, very quickly and also in an orderly fashion, so we don't have that long lines, chaos, we don't know who they are and where they're going again, but we just try to manage down the asylum process. 
So I'm going to speak about a little bit on integration per se, what the challenges are and what the fields are. And I would like to deep dive on two elements. One is education and one is employment, which are the two topics that are closest to my heart and I cover a lot in my work. So integration per se um, is actually much bigger a task than the entire asylum process and getting that organized in the first place. So the asylum process is under one ministry. In our case, it's Interior, and in other EU countries, some other ministries. But it's actually just one ministry who's handling the process with a couple of local authorities, a couple of other resources, and it's an outcome. It's not a journey, right? So it's like you can optimize for the outcome, and you can tighten it so the outcome is stable, quality assured, fair, quick, all of these elements you want. And that seemed a humongous task for governments and all stakeholders already last year. So now we're almost done with that task. Integration is actually not an outcome, really. It's a journey, right? So it's not one ministry who's responsible. It's many ministries. It's from education to health to infrastructure to labor to housing, social, family, all of that combined. Um, it's businesses who form the backbone of successful integration in the labor market. It's society. It's individuals. It's all these individuals, the NGOs. We'll hear about some on the next panel um, on the activities they take to actually integrate people into society. And it's a long journey. It's a journey for families, not just for individuals. So when we're looking at the collective pool of people who are here, um, about two-thirds male, one-third female, about the pool came um, into Europe last year. But when we're thinking family reunification, we're seeing probably in 2016 and 2017 another million or million and a half coming, and they're largely women and children from their countries of origin. So this is a second wave of integration we need to get ready for and prepared for to make sure that things like Brussels or things like Paris are not scenarios that are even possible in a collective European society. And in the end, actually, everybody wins. So I'd like to touch upon the two topics I mentioned before. So maybe I'll start with employment. So Europe is an aging continent. On average, in Germany, everybody, every couple has 1.4 children. Shrinking populations, not hard to do the math. On a European level, it's still 1.7. So two people produce 1.7 children. So that's shrinking. That's not <laughs> very hard to understand. And if you believe all in machine learning and artificial intelligence and all the wonderful things we hear, at the same time, we're an aging society and we're shrinking. So that's, per se, probably not the best news. So here's that wave of immigration coming. Uh, we're, per se, not a continent of choice anyway. So when you look at migration, skilled migration, people going to the US, they're going to Canada, they're going to Australia, they have very attractive programs, actually, for skilled migration, migrants coming in. Um, also in the Middle East, they compensate monetarily and very actively for actually managing the inflows of the talent they need for both their labor markets and their societies to function. And Europe as a continent, we don't have a collective immigration policy that makes sense, that's proactive, that's open. We do have an emergency response right now. And I think now is the time actually to get this right and to think about the people who we have here and just make sure that they arrive properly and well. And for those in the two dimensions I mentioned before, employment is probably, to me, the first. So somebody who arrives in a society, who actually makes their own living, who's contributing, who's productive, who has pride in what they do, who evolves, who sustains their own family, uh, is probably the best lever to integrating well and quickly. When your kids go to school with the kids of your colleague, you're suddenly not a foreigner coming into a country, but you're actually part of like a system, an ecosystem where you're contributing, you're part of that. And also politically, um, obviously, it's much easier to, to explain and to, to to also almost sell like to your population who has had a very positive response and then there were some mood swings backwards and you see it all in European politics, goes right, goes left. Um, so to also make the, the population as productive as quickly as possible and make them part of the community and part of the economy is probably core. In Germany alone, uh, we're going to lack between five and six million uh, skilled workers, so members of the workforce, through our demographics and through the changes in economy and digitalization and all the growth aspirations we have by 2025, between five and six million. So now over a population of 80 million, and we need them in 10 years, they need to be born, right? So they, like you, we, they, either we import them now, <laughs> just logically it doesn't square otherwise. In 10 years we need them, five or six million more, 
like, we only have the ones we have. So like either we get them tremendously more productive, then we have like our unemployment, and we also need to probably get productive and even like better and quicker employed. We have have our women, which is the topic also close to my heart, uh, activating more of our women into the workforce from 40% on average to 60% on average participation. This is also a lever, but we can't do in our society, in our economy, if we would like to sustain the levels of prosperity, growth, welfare financing we have, we cannot continue unless we tremendously increase in productivity, which uh, is hopeful, but not realistic, probably, um, without actually having skilled migration coming into the country. So since we are not the first destination of choice uh, for skilled migration in the first place, getting it right now with the migrants who are here is key. It is absolutely key. We have a million new citizens now in the country. Uh, they are likely here to stay. The kids will go to school here. They fled for something. And if we do it right now, and if we get it right, so we have them participate, if we assess their competencies properly, if we match them to the right labor market opportunities so they can get a foothold in society, that is how we get them actually productive and integrated as fast as possible. One core thing on employment I would like to highlight is uh, the topic of competency assessment. For these people, they know something. They've typically lived off something where they came from and they most likely don't carry a perfectly carryable and translatable certificate of their university degree. Some do. It's about 8%. So 8% of a million, not too many. You could say like, it's not bad as a typical dentist or IT specialist you see on the evening news who gets interviewed. This is 8% is great, like 80,000 people, fantastic. But then there's also 92% who actually don't have that perfect higher education degree we've all been waiting and looking for. There's another 10% who have something like a dual education, like a, an apprenticeship like we would classify it in some of the technical professions. But we have 80% who just don't have anything declared. We can like read out and say, okay, you are X and you know why. And therefore, um, it's tremendously important actually to think very actively about how to measure and assess their competencies to make sure that we, you distill them out without having any formal certification and understand what that person has been living on. Like whether, that, whether that's formal competences or these technical skills, is this something you can distill out of their previous vita? At the same time, is that non-technical, so personal skills, is that grit, is it perseverance, is it ability to solve problems, overcome challenges? These are actually all topics employers are looking for much more in many professions, in many professions that is unfilled today, than they are actually for the technical skills, because these skills you can typically teach. So for us collectively from a labor market perspective, understanding the competencies, being quick about the competencies without sending them into uh, like full-time apprenticeship for the next three years, but really understanding quickly what you can actually distill from that person's profile and get them productive and get them integrated will to us be the core to labor market integration. Um, education, last topic. I won't have time to dive deep on it anymore. I will just say we have one of the best educational systems in the world. It's uh, technically for free. Well, it isn't. It's financed by our taxes. But it's, it comes to very little incremental cost. Um, a third of the people coming in are under 18. A third, just imagine. So if we get them into our schools, into our systems, uh, this is probably going to be the brightest and most prosperous investment we can take in that population coming in. Um, we created about 50,000 uh, preschool places after that law was passed to entitle you for preschool in 2013. We need another 50,000 just that year to cover the children of the migrants who came in this year, just to put that in perspective. So investments in education now um, and also for the next government will be the most core investment for making uh, integration successful, let alone infrastructure, healthcare, everything else they had planned for and announced today before yesterday. Without further ado, there's a next panel coming up. They'll deep dive on some of the issues on language, on integration. I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to the discussion later on. Mm -hmm.